Hi, I'm Tiffany. And I'm Rihanna, and welcome or welcome back to Fresh Off the Broke. Fresh Off the Broke is about personal experiences growing up Asian American in a predominantly white community, Asian media, and Asian pop culture in general. Race has always been a sensitive topic. Every day, there's a base over race. With our podcast, we intend to shed light on your experiences of first generation Asian immigrants, not put them on a pedestal. We understand that race isn't everything, but there should be an acknowledgement of people of color, the knowledge gap, and the racial divide that will ideally be broken. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the episode. Today's topic is Asian skincare. And personally, I've been getting super into Asian skincare recently. Just a little tidbit. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, we'll get into it, don't worry. Um, but essentially, if you are wondering... What do we mean by Asian skincare? Pretty self-explanatory. Essentially just skincare culture in Asia, including like how people see it, how people view skincare, um, and the products of the actual skincare. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I mean, skincare and beauty especially, Facial beauty sounds kind of weird, but you know what I mean, right? Yes. yes. It's such a big part of the Asian makeup industry, especially East Asian mm-hmm. makeup industry. Mm-hmm. And I mean, with the growing population of East Asian pop culture and media over here in the west i mean there's like the k-wave and everything Mm -hmm. more and more people are getting exposed to like korean beauty or like face mask and all these things and so since you know we're we're an asian podcast we thought it would be a fitting topic Mm -hmm. and also because we like in hair and makeup and beauty yes, <laughs> very much so and it's our podcast so we can talk about whoever we want <laughs> whatever comes to mind mm-hmm. it'd be funny if one day we just did an episode where we kind of just talked about whatever because i mean some podcasts do that yeah a lot they, of like, they, they talk to each ones. other Mm -hmm. like oh how was your week what are you thinking about lately because I guess like those podcasts it's less about like you're listening to the podcast to listen to what they're actually talking about yeah it's personality yeah Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let us know if you ever want a podcast of us just talking about stuff we just switch (laughs) which I guess Mm -hmm. if we were to do that that would basically be the conversations that we have before and after podcast except we would just record it Mm mm-hmm (laughs) <laughs> like before we start recording to say like, hey Rihanna so like what's up how was your week how was I don't know insert thing <laughs> and then we start talking yeah but anyway skincare back to the episode <laughs> growing up I think that skincare has always been something that I was pretty exposed to hmm. whether that was through my mom family in general and then different Asian media Mm -hmm. and or when you're going to Asian store like I remember back when we were talking about did we ever talk we talked about Pacific Mall before right yeah yeah Pacific Mall has a lot of skincare Mm -hmm. and so just growing up in general I feel like you knew that skincare was a big thing Uh uh-huh was that same for you um to be completely honest are you saying you would lie to our audience (laughs) yes um (gasps) but anyways um (laughs) sorry guys i'm just kidding i would never that was a lie um but i think I was more exposed to it when I got older. Um, By older, I mean like pre-teenage because 
um, just like genetics, like within my family, there was never really like a big issue with like skincare or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Like there was never like, I don't know how to say this, but like, you know, there was no like acne problem that ran in the family or something like that Mm -hmm. when I was younger that's that's what people assumed would happen to me but then as I got older like my skin is wait people assumed what would happen to you like I would have the same like I I wouldn't have oh right right, okay okay. yeah um but as I got older that like was not the case for me like I have pretty iffy skin so um I started to like expose myself more like research and stuff like that and just on top of that, like, it was the same time I started getting into K-pop. Um, mm-hmm. Or, like, I was into K-pop during this time. So just naturally, I was exposed to Asian skincare before I was exposed to, like, Western skincare. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, on top of that, um, I think a big Western skincare brand, especially for, like, teenagers at least during a certain time, like not recently, maybe like maybe over a decade ago at some point, at this point. Um, But I think proactive was really big. Um, Like proactive. Oh, right. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Unlock something. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I had like one family friend who tried it and it like messed his skin up even more. So that was the only thing when I was younger that I would hear about skincare. So naturally, when I learned more about Asian skincare, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll stick to this instead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I think, I get my experience wasn't uh, unsimilar to yours. No one in my family really dealt with skincare problem per se Uh uh-huh although like the emphasis that I was talking about kind of came from things like sunscreen and moisturizer Uh yeah things things like that I didn't really know a whole lot about treatment oh my gosh you mentioning proactive is really doing things to my brain right now yeah and it's funny because like that brand does not really exist anymore. Uh-huh. Speaking of proactive, I think the fact that proactive isn't really a brand anymore is probably partially due to the rise of Asian skincare. And it leads me to want to talk about like, you know, the whole difference between Western and Asian skincare, because it is very, very different. I think a lot of people would assume, like, if you had no idea, you just assume, like, oh, one's just made in Asia, one's not. But no, um, there's quite a big difference between Asian skincare products and Western skincare products. Um, For example, I think the main thing would be that they're targeted for different things or, um, like, keywords used in branding or just the actual product itself like what it's actually used for yeah there are very different focuses in western and asian so for example asian skincare or no no western skincare it's a lot of anti-aging and acne control so western skincare is targeted for people who have what we would consider an issue with your skin so anti-aging like if you have wrinkles you would need skincare or if if you have acne you would need skincare but yeah it's very prescriptive in a way yeah but it's not targeted to just people with like regular skin or so-so skin it's mainly targeted for quote-unquote issues I think calling like aging or acne an issue is kind of problematic but you know for sake of making it easy issues um on the other hand asian skincare is more like it promotes itself on what it does in general so like hydrating 
or blocking out the sun. It's not like technically, yes, hydration and SPF coverage does help with anti-aging slash it can help with acne, but it, they're not saying this is a product for anti-aging or this is a product for acne control. It's more, this is a product that will bring hydration. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's not targeted for people with problems. You should just be having like skincare. You just take care of your skin. It's like brushing your teeth. You don't only brush your teeth if you have cavities or you think you're growing cavities, right? Oh gosh, at you that just, point, like <laughs> yeah, like first of all, yeah. you're already way too far oh, gone. gone. <laughs> <laughs> but skincare is just another routine that you need to have. Typically, within Asian culture, like skin, you're, you just take care of your skin. Like you wash your body, you wash your skin, you wash your, um, you brush your teeth, comb your hair. Like it's just one of those things that are important. Mm -hmm. A funny thing, I actually just looked up proactive, and they do still exist, but you, you're oh. completely right about the, not the, the sand sounds very sad, but uh, they're certainly not as popular anymore. Yeah. It's, I'm sure it have, probably has something to do with new skincare trends. And then online, it looks like there are some issues, like some trust issues surrounding the brand. Because some people think their commercials are misleading. Mm -hmm. P. So, so yeah, that's something that's allegedly happening. Mm. Uh, Not good for them. <laughs> No. I think they also rebranded. They don't look this the way I remember them. Mm. And I remember they used to have a lot of celebrity endorsements. When yeah. I was looking them up just now, there's pictures of Justin Bieber, Kendall Jenner. Yeah. Oh, also, just to note, in um Asia, especially East Asia, going to a dermatologist is a lot more common. Oh, like certainly. again, here you go to a dermatologist if you have like a a big issue, like there's or, something and, or a lot of money. Yeah, or a lot of money. Um, but over there, it's just like going to see the doctor. Like you have a doctor, you have a dermatologist, you have a dentist. You know. Yeah, my aunt and then other people I know. I think I mentioned this in the beauty episode that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Or the beauty episode that we did, I mean. <laughs> uh, I have people in my family and then just people I know in China in general that see a dermatologist mm -hmm. semi-regularly. Mm -hmm. And it's more affordable. I mean, it's, it's still an expense. Yeah. that you have to account for and yeah. that you would account for in your life if uh -huh. you decide to but it is way more accessible than it would be here because I think a dermatologist here is seen as way more like you were saying if you have a problem so I don't know I don't know how to word this in a way where it sounds like I'm not calling them doctors or I I'm not sure how to word it it's just it seems like here it's more of like a serious doctor situation uh -huh. and then over there it's like a regular check-in kind of situation uh-huh yeah that, that makes sense right that's yeah yeah and I mean I have skincare from my aunt from her dermatologist mm-hmm she when I go back there's this certain lotion like this certain vitamin E moisturizer that she would give me a bunch of bottles of or a bunch of little containers of hmm. through her dermatologist and that's cool I don't that's think cool. I would be able to do that here and yeah like, definitely not in an affordable way mm -hmm. I mean through my aunt it's free because she's just giving it to me but you know you get the point. Yeah. 
I think we're really dogging on proactive, but <laughs> oh my gosh, please <laughs> no, don't no, no. get us a lawsuit. No, please, proactive. You were you were very popular. You were sponsored by literally everyone back then. You had your moment, okay, but. Nowadays, I found that a lot of Western brands are like inspired by or just have full connection to Asian skincare. Like, for example, like think Tatcha or think Laneige, like they're straight up K beauty inspired or Japanese beauty inspired. I think Tatcha is Japanese and Laneige is K beauty inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, but even like random no-name brands that I'll find at um like my local like drug store not dr- you know what I mean uh-huh. um, but the knockoff brands that no one really knows about or whatever like they'll have the keyword k-beauty on it and it's fully a western brand that no one knows about um but everything nowadays is either taking inspiration from Asian skincare or straight up just like trying to brand itself as K-beauty period Mm -hmm. which I find interesting yeah there's definitely a there you can see the effort to try to mirror the aesthetic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's a very distinct look to Asian beauty and Asian skincare, their ad, uh-huh. and there's a very distinct look to Western ad. I mean, when I think of perfume ad, yeah, they're always dark, right? Like this mm-hmm. dark at night, and then there's sometimes there's running or there's a yeah. car. It's very intense. There's just very intense. <laughs> I have a very clear image in my head of what a western kind of perfume ad yeah, looks too. like which perfume has nothing to do with skincare I guess yeah not <laughs> but very specific so you can really tell the difference when a brand is trying to market itself a specific way uh-huh one other thing that's really big in Asian beauty and Asian skincare is sunscreen and like mm. SPF and sun protection. Of course, let's not ignore the elephant in the room, colorism. Yes. Definitely a sure. big reason. For sure. And a lot, I feel like it's more common or it's almost a like given nowadays that Asian beauty products have some level of SPF protection or SPF yeah. factors, for lack of a better words. I'm not yeah. super well versed in the terminology. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't necessarily find that as much in Western beauty. And I mean, that's, that's not to say they won't. I mean, I've seen products that have some sun protection but I think for every one that I see in a western product I think maybe 50 Mm -hmm. in Asian products just because it's such a big deal Mm -hmm. and I mean sun protection is also really important and I guess maybe part of the reason is because actually I don't know I was originally gonna say for instance, in China, you get more sun exposure and it's hotter, which is true. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think of North American climate right now. Because, I mean, in Canada, we don't really have the harshest sun. So that could be a reason why it's not as big of a deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't have I don't have it down to a science. Yeah. I think it's more like... in especially eastern asia or east asia colorism Mm -hmm. is a really big thing Mm -hmm. all over here like yes there is colorism there's racism period but because Mm -hmm. there's more diversity 
in mm -hmm. skin tone here there's less of a concern of like oh every single product needs spf to like you know yeah oh and then white skin like skin whitening yeah we did a whole episode on that yeah and also like a lot of um products are either like lightening or whitening like it will makeup specifically there's lots of like whitening powders so I think colorism is just the main mm -hmm. I mean I'm sure there are other reasons but I think colorism is a pretty big one. <laughs> oh, and also just to note um we're talking a lot about eastern or east asia products eastern asia e east asian products jesus um but i just want to point out that like especially in southeast asia um people just use east asian products like it's such a big thing that we in southeast asia you just used east asian products there's uh -huh. no like different type of skincare between East Asia slash Southeast Asia. I can't really speak for South Asia, but yeah, just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like how um like K-pop culture or like anime slash Japanese culture is so big in like the Philippines or something like that. It's like that for skincare yeah and i mean business-wise east asia skincare industry makeup like beauty industry it's bigger and then from a in a mainstream way those countries also get more attention mm -hmm. so that probably has something to do with it mm-hmm Lots of different, there's lots of context to this. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pinpoint. Yeah. These are just are, like pretty good guesses. I don't think mm -hmm. we're far off, but. Again. Yeah, we're, we're not economists or. Yeah. Marketing specialists. Mm -hmm. One thing that's really been trending lately and just like popping up in general in terms of skincare trend is gua sha. Mm. I feel like I've seen in the past few years, I've really seen it everywhere in terms of people making videos about it. And then I also just like see it more often now in stores. Mm. And if you don't know what gua sha is, it's a traditional Chinese medicine practice. And what I'm about to explain to you, if you do know what gua sha is from more of a Western perspective, might sound like I'm talking about something different just because it's been packaged a different way. Mm. But so gua sha, traditionally speaking, is when you use a tool and it's made from a very like special material or it's made in a very uh, specific way. Uh, sometimes it can be using stone and it's like a a blob shaped kind of thing and it's smooth mm -hmm. and you scrape it on your body as if you were so like if you were to make a fist and then put it against your arm and then you just like rub your arm downward with force it's like that but with mm -hmm. a smooth kind of rockish object and the idea is that you are uh, promoting blood circulation like it can help with lymph nodes or puffiness some people do it on uh, with their face and a lot of the time you rub until you're very red mm. and when I say red I don't mean pink or I mean 
red as if, I don't know, you got slapped. I mean, red, like you start seeing red spots or mm. you're, there's just like red patch. It's almost like there's internal, not bleeding. That sounds really dramatic, but it's really red. It's kind of, I might throw up an image. Mm, okay. It's not gross. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's not disgusting. It's just, um, your skin gets really red in a way where it kind of looks like you hurt yourself, maybe. Mm. Is it like a level right before a bruise or like in between? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good way of putting it. Mm. So it's like, not like pink, but not bruised, like in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. It's very red. Okay. And the the whole point is you're pr promoting blood circulation. Mm. You're you're helping with lymph nodes, and I mean, some people also think that you're kind of like letting out the the bad stuff, the bad energy, just like bad, the bad. Mm -hmm. And lately. Which isn't wrong. Uh, Guasha has been really trending in the West as a face slimming tool because you can take the tool, and people do this like in, in China or wherever, where you take it and then maybe you go uh, you scrape it along your cheekbone upwards. And the whole idea is you're kind of like pulling your face back and you're slimming your face mm -hmm. and I, it's not wrong but I don't personally really love the way that Guasha is promoted as a slimming tool uh -huh. partially because it feels a little unhealthy to me and it also feels misleading because they're mm -hmm. not wrong it helps reduce puffiness you can wake up in the morning and then with the usual kind of slight puffiness at your face in your face, you can take the gua sha and then kind of like go along, straight your face, like press down, uh, press down or move or remove the lymph node. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what the terminology would be, but because of that, you're reducing the puffiness. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you're like scraping your face, you're promoting movement from inside. Yeah. And so your face is gonna look slimmer. But I don't love the way that it's like, oh, um, me after one month of using gua sha, me after using mm. it for several months. And I'm not going to discredit it as a face living tool. I mean, I can see how doing that every day could potentially, quote unquote, slim your face. Because I guess your body is getting used to the lymph node reduction. Yeah, the drainage of your lymph yeah, node. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just a personal little qualm I have mm -hmm. and then I also question if all the gua sha products being sold nowadays by western stores and brands are authentic material wise I feel like some of them might just be kind of plastic and it's not supposed to be plastic because I mean growing up when I went back to China I, I've been to gua sha stores and stuff like that just because it's common and it's also it's considered a cool health thing mm -hmm. and it's a I don't know if I want to call it a super common practice but it's a practice that people know about and I so I've been to those stores and they have like brushes they have the blob like the reason why I say blob like is because it really does kind of just look like a blob yeah yeah uh, in outline very organic shape mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're in art class <laughs> where was I oh and it was it, as far as I remember because I mean um, what, one time many years ago, I went on one of those like seven day tours uh, with my mom in Shanghai mm. and surrounding cities because uh, we wanted to kind of like do something 
uh, want, we wanted to try something new before we directly went back to visit our family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the places that we were brought to was kind of like a gua sha store or a factory or just like a specialist in a way. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that I remember learning is that it's kind of stone based or like ceramic. And so if it's plastic, I mean, you could probably still get use out of it. Because I mean, it's not necessarily, I, mean, I don't know, but it's not necessarily that the stone, because you could have plastic washer, I guess. You could still do the drainage yeah but that's just not the same it's it's not the way it was intended for yeah because uh i i don't know how to put it it's just like you could accomplish the same the goal but it's just not really right I mean so you, I could, feel like you could just you could chalk it up to whitewashing it in a way yeah and like plastic would definitely not be as durable as a mm -hmm. stone mm -hmm. yeah it's it's like practical. turning it into almost like a fast fashion trend. yeah no for sure because a lot of fast fashion in the west from what I've seen first of all like in the west gua sha is just a little thing that you rub on your face a little bit like not till it's red not like it just straight up you some people just pass it along their face and they're like oh if I use it for a month it'll change my face shape no mm -hmm. <laughs> like a lot of people here call it like a placebo because people aren't using it right first of all and secondly lots of fast fashion brands like in-store fast fashion brands have like plastic ones I've seen it mm -hmm. Um, it comes in like a little set with another jade roller, quote unquote. It's obviously not jade, it's plastic also, but yeah, definitely become a fas fast fashion trend here. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to hear like you speak about like going to an actual proper store and learning about it because I didn't know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Yeah, it is super cool. I, it was, pack, the trip was packaged as a, kind of like a shopping trip or like a commercial trip in a way. And so we went to Jade jewelry places as well and like mm. pearl mm. places. And the idea was mainly just for you to buy stuff because they uh -huh. got the spot they got they were sponsored by those stores uh -huh, and uh -huh. blah, understandable blah, blah. and so that was kind of the main point but there there was some educational value to it uh mm -hmm. like the pearl factory or the pearl not, not factory the pearl place we went to there was a, a little part where they were explaining how they how you could have like pearl powder or like pearl lotion or whatever mm -hmm. it was and it was kind of cool that is cool the more you know. Mm -hmm. Speaking of in-person stores, no, <laughs> I'm not good. Wait, speaking of stores, um, Asian skincare, even though we are in a Western context, mm -hmm. it's still available to us, whether that be uh, either online or in real life. Um, I think especially in like, gta area or the greater toronto area the face shop is probably the most oh my gosh yeah accessible korean skincare brand you would find in like just any mall which is really interesting to me because the face shop isn't like the most popular one mm -hmm. i think maybe if we're talking five to ten years ago the face shop was super popular mm -hmm. or more popular than it is now but um it's for some reason very accessible here mm -hmm. um I do know that Innisfree has opened some real like 
in-person stores oh yeah uh when they first i don't even remember where but one, one of the times when they opened a new store my my friend went and bought a bunch of stuff mm-hmm. yeah innisfree um we brought a pacific mall i know pacific mall used to have a bunch of different skincare stores mm -hmm. but a lot of them have closed like there was a cause rx store there was a misha store um but there oh my god gone. misha yeah um but i think your safest bet for any type of east asian skincare product would be going to your local asian supermarket because mm -hmm. a lot of them not all of them, I will say, but a lot of them have a skincare slash beauty slash hair care section. Mm -hmm. And they have, if they have the section, this section, they will have like pretty much every brand that is trending right now in mm -hmm. the Western context. It's very interesting. But mm. they also, I really like these supermarkets and these sections because they don't like bump the price up like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um there's a store in Canada called Showcase, and it basically sells, like, TikTok trends or internet trends, and because Asian skincare became a trend, they started selling things like the CauseRx snail mu mucin? Mucin? Mucin. Um, they started yeah. selling the, like, snail essence product for, mm -hmm. like, $20 more than it should be. Um because you know people will pay for it and they think oh this is the only place I can get it in person but no <laughs> go to your local Asian supermarket they probably have a skin skincare section mm -hmm. and in terms of online I think your best bet would be yes style um there's a lot of like resellers slash just like small businesses that sell k beauty j beauty any asian beauty slash skincare products but yes style even though shipping is pretty expensive it's the most reliable one i'd say okay uh, i didn't know that if you're not buying directly from the company obviously i don't know mm -hmm. what it's like buying directly from something like innisfree okay um, but yes style um has lots of skincare no, and sephora is a pretty good place they don't have everything that's for sure but they do have some like i know that they've started to carry innisfree products um they have things like laneige and tatcha which are you know on the border between an, a western slash k beauty slash j beauty brand um oh and also I completely forgot but <laughs> this is kind of niche but if you are at like an airport oh no I guess that would only be in Asia why was oh for some reason I thought like oh at like an airport in Canada you could get like oh you think you like duty free. free shops yeah duty free shops and then I, I mean realized, I don't know oh, wait, no. we might have I haven't been to the airport in a long time. Yeah, me neither. Well, yeah, I haven't. I've, like, picked people up or driven them to the airport. Mm -hmm. But I haven't been inside, I haven't been inside the terminal and stuff in a really long time. Uh-huh. haven't caught a flight in a while. Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for our next episode where we travel... But yeah where should we go um oh my gosh we should do the thing where we spin a globe and then just put our finger down and wherever. oh my gosh the day that i am able to do that the the day that i can support doing that <laughs> would be that would be so cool hmm be very fun and then we vlog Oh, you know, actually be really cool. I mean, th not that that wasn't cool, but something that I guess is a little more Bob related. Uh -huh. Can you imagine if we went somewhere like Taiwan or Singapore? Sick. And we 
went to their market, like their like night market. Oh my god! Like, like, I like, wish. The street food, and then I we wish. vlogged it. Oh, that'd be so cool. I want to go to Taiwan and drink bubble tea. Oh my gosh! And get the popcorn chicken. Please. This will happen eventually. Don't worry, mm -hmm. guys. Yeah. I love the idea of, and this is such a basic thing to say, but I genuinely love the idea of going to a place and then eating the food yeah. that they're famous for. Yeah. Again, stay tuned, y'all. Mm -hmm. so, we're getting too excited. We are. Or not too excited. We are perfectly reasonable. Yeah, we're planning. It's happening. Future. Yeah. That's it. Mm hmm I guess one thing I appreciate about the increase in popularity of Asian skincare is that it makes it more accessible for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in ways it became more expensive and also in ways it became less expensive. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking about how, for example, maybe a long time ago, if I wanted insert thing, maybe I would have to wait to go back to China to get it. Mm -hmm. But now I don't necessarily have to because there are more skincare stores now mm. or that product is carried here now. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That was also such a big thing for me once... Um, it got popular here because again being so into like k-beauty as a kid but not having any way to get it besides if I were to see it in person because like you mm -hmm. know I was very young like now I'm like oh my gosh that's the thing that I've wanted for so long and I can have it now it's super cool prices not so much but it's cool I guess we could turn this to you guys now. Where do you find your skincare? Do you have an Asian skincare routine slash Asian skincare products that you use? Yeah, I mean, know. how were you, how did you experience being exposed or not being exposed to skincare? Hmm. I mean, it also depends on if you are, are an Asian and if you grew up in the way mm -hmm. we want to know yeah and I mean tell us about trends that you've seen maybe and also how I guess people around you perceive them because mm -hmm. I mean for me growing up in school I Asian skincare was not a thing at all yeah I don't even really I can't even say it ever was in yeah, any no. of the schools I went to. No. I'm sure so maybe it was different now. for you. Yeah. Let us know. Maybe like you got into Asian skincare when it became like a trend, which mm -hmm. no shame in that. But like, let us know because we wouldn't know what that's like. Uh huh. And then since we're getting into the whole telling us about your thoughts and feelings. Sounds like a therapist. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we get a license to be... You never know. Yeah, you never know. You never let them know your next move. For real. <laughs> Anyways, like I was saying, since we're getting into the whole telling us about your thought, you know what time it is reach the end of the episode and so we want to thank you for tuning in listening to us ramble and talk about skincare let us know if you've ever had like kind of a skincare journey or how you like what's your relationship with asian skincare if you have one at all mm. what is asian skincare to you <laughs> and let us know if maybe you are interested in any trends, you know, favorite skincare brands, skincare products, you know. You share, 
Rian and I are interested in skincare and Asian beauty and things like that. So, you know, just like just sharing with your friends. Yeah, we'd love to hear about it. Mm-hmm. I actually really do just love talking to you guys. Yeah, for real. Interactions are very wholesome. I really like it because it, it it makes it feel very real and mm-hmm. personal. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to see the number on the screen of you know, how many followers you have, or whatever, and it's another thing to interact with the people because yeah. then you're like you're seeing them as, as individual people. Because mm-hmm. I don't know. I, th- I think celebrities have also talked about this, like people with like millions and millions of followers, like to a certain point. You don't really know how much it is, but then you go to a concert hall and then it's like, whoa. Yeah. Crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, if you guys like this episode and want to stay connected with us, Check out our website in the description. It contains links to our streaming platforms such as Spotify, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, and more. Follow us for more behind-the-scenes content, announcements, and other random things we decide to put on there. See you next time. Bye. Bye.